This is Trend Following Radio, where great thinking comes alive. Nobel Prize winners, legendary traders, best-selling authors, and the pros that know what drive us irrational human beings. I am your host, Michael Covell. Not filtered, raw, honest. That's my passion. What a journey. So let's see, since February 25th, Tokyo, Hong Kong, Singapore, and Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia. And since March 4th, it was Hong Kong, Singapore, and Malaysia all together. And there was one stretch in there. Look, I'm no cry for me Argentina here. Um, there was one stretch in there of 23 presentations, anywhere from 60 to 90 minutes long, uh, spread over three cities. That is easily the most talking about trend following that I've ever done in person in that sh- such short period of time. Who was I talking to? Well, uh, Nice Bank, CLSA, was kind enough to put me in front of many, many, many institutional investors in all these fine cities. And I have to say, I, I do love all of the cities that I've been in. Hong Kong's great. I mean, you can literally walk out your door in Hong Kong. And uh, if you're in central Hong Kong, you can walk out your door and everything's so vertical. The buildings are so tight together and everything's so vertical. You can literally, I think you could live within 200 meters uh, of where you're staying and never go anywhere. Everything is there. It's it's amazing how close everything is. Um, Singapore, Singapore is just perfect. Uh, you know, I said on a blog post, it's 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 sad that America doesn't have the ability to to build a Singapore. I just go look at even go look at the videos on YouTube and the pictures. Uh, something like the Marina Bay Sands, which was built by Sheldon Adelson, which is the uh, the guy who put up the uh, Venetian and the Palazzo in Vegas. And just look at this thing. I mean, the whole I don't know. The pool's like 60, 60 floors up, hanging off a ledge. And you look at this and you're like, man, most Americans, heck, probably most Westerners that have not been to Singapore have no earthly idea uh, that this place exists. And uh, I mean, look, the banking community does, the finance community does, obviously mainland Chinese do, and um, but it's amazing. I mean, it's just, it's, it's, it's just, it's clean, it's perfect. The Hawker Center is where you can buy all the street food, fantastic. Hey, fantastic street food in Hong Kong as well. Uh, I was all over Hong Kong for the street food. Uh, You can't beat it. And KL, Kuala Lumpur, where I have just arrived uh, earlier this week, is awesome too. In fact, I had only planned to be in what they affectionately call KL for two days. That was the schedule. And I was going to go back to Singapore. And I got here and I said, well, shoot, I've got some time. I don't have to be to uh, mainland China. I don't have to be to Beijing till April 15th. Uh, so I, I decided in a moment's notice, I will stay in KL for three or four weeks. Uh, it's hot, uh, but it's, it's very interesting. It's, it's, uh, I've never heard an American say I'm going to Malaysia, uh, for vacation. And frankly, I'm not sure why it's really, uh, it's worth it. It's definitely worth it. It's an d- interesting place. People are great. Food is great. So uh, much different food. Look, Tokyo is food porn. Uh, the, the food in Tokyo is awesome. Uh, great food in Hong Kong as well. Food in Malaysia gets to be different in the sense it's more of this Penang style food. So you have the Malay people, you have the Chinese people, and you have the Indian people all kind of blended together in this one culture. And you get this really hot, hot, spicy uh, Penang style food uh, nicknamed after the island of Penang, which I hopefully am going to get to here in Malaysia. So that's where I've been uh, culturally. And so what have I been doing here in terms of speaking and what types of presentations have I been giving? Well, all three cities and including my presentation in Tokyo back on February 25th, all very similar and lots of institutional players who want to learn about trend following. Many of them not really familiar with it at all. And 
occasionally a few people brought one of my books or they had read one of my books. But by and large, I would say 90%, 95% of the people that I sat down with in small group meetings, and generally I'd be going to their offices. And I'm talking about the largest fund managers in Hong Kong, KL, Singapore. And also in, in Singapore and KL, the sovereign wealth managers of each of the countries. So I really had some, some interesting access to present the gospel of trend following. So what's the, what's the style, what's the by and large style of the people that I was speaking with? Well, probably not a surprise. And frankly, this probably is exactly the same as in America, Western Europe, et cetera. I mean, trend following is a minority. It is an alternative minority strategy. I'm not even sure why we should call it alternative. It's a minority strategy. It just doesn't exist in the minds of those people. So most of the fund managers I sat down with uh, were long only, fundamental, value-based. That's it. Maybe, maybe they used, uh, or they said they used some predictive technical indicators on top of their strategy, but that was it. Long only, uh, fundamental value investors. And so I would go through the typical presentation. I don't not, well, I shouldn't say typical, but the, the presentation that I would want them to understand is, hey, let's talk about the, the big picture difference between trend following and what you do. I mean, I wouldn't necessarily beat everybody up and say you have to stop your current value-based approach, but I'd say, look, there's a tremendous advantage to knowing if you can bring this other strategy in-house, a trend following strategy that produces returns at a different point in time than your typical fundamental value returns, that's useful information. That's extremely useful. So I wanted them to see the differences. And then we went through, I went through the behavioral finance aspect, black swan aspect, the outlier move issue with trend following. I wanted everyone to see that if you could be on a desert island, and if you're sitting out there right now, you're saying to yourself, hold on, Covell, what are you talking about, desert island? What, what, do, what do you, look, you wake up tomorrow and you have nothing. You're sitting on the desert island. It's you and your coconuts and your finger, uh, your finger sand doodles. That's all you've got. You got nothing else except you have the closing price of the 75 most liquid global markets and you get that closing price every day. I don't know, maybe it just magically appears in the sand or you've got a ticker tape, whatever, but you don't got anything else, nothing. No CNBC, no Bloomberg, no magazines, no, no Forbes, uh, no International Herald Tribune, Zilcho, no New York Times, no Wall Street Journal, nothing, 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 nada, no Al Jazeera, nothing. You on the desert island with your 75 most liquid global markets and a phone, I guess, so you can call your broker to place your trades. And all you've got is a closing price. You get a closing price each day. Now, can you look at all of that data over time and figure out a way to make money? That's the challenge. Can you find a positive mathematical edge in that stew of data from all those different markets? You know, and you, know, you don't even know the names of the markets. You don't have to know the names of the markets, do you, to trade them? This is price data analysis. The names of the markets are relevant how? So can you make money? Can you find a positive mathematical edge in the great spirit of Ed Thorpe and beat the dealer, the Kelly criteria, using that kind of, you know, you got your system, it's got an edge. Then you apply the, your, your, your Ed Thorpe inspiration, your Ed Sakota inspiration, you have your bet sizing, you know how much you can bet. Now what? Can you trade it? Can you make money? Can you make money on the desert island? That is the rallying cry of the trend following world. That is the rallying cry of trend following success. The desert island trading. That's it. So I presented, 
I mean, this is kind of a short, quick, and maybe I'll give a longer version for the podcast audience, but this is a very quick version of where I would go with many of these institutional clients. And I think many of them really enjoy the presentation. They would realize, hey, this produces money at a certain point in time that our strategy does not produce. That's useful information to us. Now, even if they could not make an allocation to a trend-following firm, even if they elected not to trade as a trend-following trader in-house, I said, well, no, why not have a model portfolio, a simulated portfolio, so you can at least know when trend-following is doing well? Because that bit of information, the way that a trend-following operation operates, could be a useful piece of fundamental information for your fundamental trading shop. You know, most of the questions were pretty straightforward, but I would find, I think I found universally over the last couple of weeks, Tom DeMarc. I, I've, I've never read a Tom DeMarc book, but I know there's a lot of predictive technical indicators in there. And uh, that's not what trend following is, obviously, but that it's amazing. I heard that name come up more than just about anything. And making sure people understood the difference between predictive technical analysis and reactive technical analysis, something I first outlined in my first book, Trend Following, was, was paramount. That, I really had to get that one across. Now, I think one of the most interesting things, perhaps, was the feedback. Because I guess they, they would fill in some feedback forms and I would get pieces of this feedback uh, later on. and. Let me, I'm gonna find an article here. I wanna read something from an article really quick that I found the other day, because I think this is interesting before I go into some of the feedback. So here's the article. It's called The Net Effect of Mischief Makers. And so I, th I saw this article in the Singapore Straits Times uh, paper, and I guess it was, it was talking about uh, people's views on the internet. And a reader comments, and it's talking about how paradise was lost. And so they went ahead and they asked over a thousand people to carefully read a news post on a fictitious blog explaining the potential risks and benefits of a new technology. Uh, da, 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 da. They, they, and then they asked participants to read the comments on the post, supposedly from other readers, and respond to questions regarding the article's content. Half of our sample was exposed to civil reader comments and the other half to rude ones. Though the actual content length and intensity of the comments, which varied from being supportive of the new technology being very wary of the risks, were consistent across both groups. The only difference was the rude ones contained, you know, curse words or, you know, just nasty stuff. So the results were both surprising and disturbing. Uncivil comments not only polarized readers, but they often changed a participant's interpretation of the news story itself. In the civil group, those who initially did or did not support the technology, whom we identify with preliminary survey questions, continued to feel the same way after reading the comments. Those exposed to rude comments, however, ended up with a much more polarized understanding of the risks connected with the technology. Simply including ad hominem attacks in a reader comment was enough to make study participants think the downside of the reported technology was greater than they had previously thought. I, you know, I've instinctively known this forever. Having grown up under the internet, watched comments explode, watch, you know, so many of the positive people just steer clear of comments and you get so many trolls and negative people out there. And as an author, as someone who writes, these trolls are bright because it's kind of like, you know, they, they seemingly think, well, you're an author, you wrote something or you're, you, you published some comments, you should be able to take it. You know, you should, once again, in a real world, you wouldn't walk down the street and walk up to somebody and curse in their face because I would drop you if you did it to me. I mean, I would, I would, you know, drop you. And I mean what I'm saying. I would drop you if you walked up and cursed me in my face. Maybe not today, but y you know what I mean. But see, the internet has allowed this kind of, uh, these kind of just, uh, these trolls to operate. And so it was interesting to me, and this is a really little, a fun little article, but God, can you just imagine that they've actually scientifically shown, and, and this is just one study, but the idea of just having, negative comments causes people to be so untrustworthy of their own judgments that they can't even t 
take objective information in and believe it anymore because just reading ad hominem attacks causes them to pause, even if they believe and understand the content that they're reading. That's amazing. So I saw some of the negative comments and uh, that came in and you just kind of shake your head. I think the thing that I saw that was that was most uh, most interesting because I've seen this one for uh, frankly over a decade. I'm not revealing the secret sauce. I'm holding something back. There's something out there new. It's all changed. You're not telling me. Everyone's doing something different now. I can tell you right now, beyond a shadow of a doubt, anybody that thinks like that about trend following trading is never going to do it, never going to succeed, just not happening. It's not going to happen. I mean, you got at some point you got to step back and you got to say, well, am I looking at objective information? Can I look at a system, a trend following system? Can I test it? Can I then go look at professional trend following managers and see how they've performed? Can I compare it all? Can I believe in it? Or do I allow myself to get distracted by other people's comments? Do I allow myself to get distracted by society? And maybe that's ultimately the big picture issue that I'm learning about this trip that I'm on right now, this journey that I'm on right now to explore trend following, to explore all these different countries. It's the idea of distraction versus focus. And distraction kills focus. Look, it's fun to have a Facebook page. I use it to communicate with everyone. It's great. But I don't allow myself to be distracted by it. That is, that might be my that might be my my newest delivery, my newest incarnation will be to help people navigate the distraction to find the focus. And if you ultimately want to compare perhaps the buy and hold fundamental value-based world, from a trend following perspective, one could argue it's distraction. And that ultimately, price, price-based systems are the ultimate focus. I see a time when those awake will understand how to make money in up, down, and surprise markets. Whether new trader or experienced, college student or financial advisor, protecting against a crash or just trying to make a lot of money, Trend Following offers everyone an answer in uncertain times. To get started immediately, send me an email, michael at covell.com. I will send you the right trend following steps to take along with my free video. But if you want to buy and hold, trust the government and trust Wall Street. This is absolutely not for you.